Thank you for joining us here this week on windsurftoots.com. Uh, this is the second part of our four-part series about Microsoft failover clustering. Um, last week we just kind of talked a little bit about some of the theory and what some of the um, requirements are for clustering and some of the definitions, things like that. So if you're not totally familiar uh, with clustering or you're new to it, I would recommend checking that video out first. Um, and this week what we're going to do is we are actually going to prep our systems uh, for the cluster install. So there's a couple things we're going to have to do. There's some prerequisites. Um, as you can see, we already have two systems set up here. Um, one of the prerequisites um, and something to let you know about is that you do either need um, to have an enterprise or data center edition of the Microsoft Server operating system. So as you can see here, we are working with two Windows Server 2008 R2 enterprise hosts. Um, data center would work just well. Um, just as well and we have to have both of these hosts in the domain so as you can see here the full computer name um, the systems are in our domain already and we have already covered how to do this in previous videos so we're not going to do that I wanted to save a little bit of time um, <clears throat> one thing that might be a little bit different if you are familiar with Windows 2003 clustering or uh, you know old Windows 2000 clustering we would have had to go to the domain and create a single domain account that would manage both of these cluster nodes um, this is no longer a requirement in Windows 2008 R2 um, the installation of the cluster service itself will go through and create the appropriate groups with the least possible permissions uh, to run these cluster services so that's uh, an improvement uh, by Microsoft so that's really excellent so what we're going to go over is we are going to cover configuring our interfaces because there is some specific requirements for the interfaces we are going to cover reaching out with the iSCSI initiator um, and Microsoft has now a, a, a built-in iSCSI initiator um, so we can go out and we will grab two disks not just one but two disks from our NAS unit that we have set up using iSCSI and I'm not going to actually cover setting up iSCSI it will be different uh, depending on your type of NAS unit so it's a little bit beyond the scope of this tutorial um, but I, I do want to let you know that shared storage of some type is a requirement uh, for Microsoft clustering. So this will give you a little bit of an overview. Um, I just want to take you through and we're going to start off um, on our network interfaces. And some of these things might seem a little odd to you as we go through, but I will explain um, why we are doing what we are doing. So I want to show you the network interfaces that we have on our two hosts. So we're going to go to change adapter settings. I want you to be able to see these side by side and go set these up here too. Change adapter settings. We'll go to details. Okay, <clears throat> so now, see now what you're seeing is we have a heartbeat, we have a iSCSI, and we have a Windserve Toots network adapter. I have labeled these all and I would recommend that you do so as well so that when you're working with different network interfaces in your cluster it's very very easy to identify um, what you're working with. So as you might be able to guess this Windserve Toots labeled interface is the network interface that will be presented to our domain. iSCSI as it is aptly labeled will be the network interface that will handle all of the traffic for our iSCSI um, initiator and target so all of our data will be passing over this the heartbeat if you remember is uh, from the previous video the um, way that the cluster communicates um, within its nodes to ensure that uh, the nodes are up now as a side note there's two things what we're gonna do is we're gonna hit the alt key so we can bring up our menu here and that's just all you have to do is hit alt okay just on your keyboard and that will bring up this menu here so you can see it we wanna go into advanced and advanced settings here 
And what you're going to notice is I have set my domain interface, my WinServe Toots interface, to be the first bound interface. Um, this is not, it, basically, it's relevant for the SQL server that we're going to be installing. It's important for that piece. So, how I have my interfaces set up is WinServe Toots, um, which is my domain facing interface, my Heartbeat interface is next, and then my iSCSI interface is third. Now, if you know anything about iSCSI, you should really go through and your maximum transmission unit, if this was to be in a production environment, um, you would want to go through and configure, um, I actually don't think I can do it on this one because it's a virtual uh, machine, but if you were using actual network interfaces, you would want to set your uh, maximum transmission unit um, on the interface and all of the switches, routers, and your iSCSI endpoint to have an MTU of 9,000 bits. Okay, um, and what this will allow for is uh, more rapid communication through your iSCSI network, larger packet sizes, and greater throughput. So that's just if you were doing this in a production environment, you would want to be able to set that MTU size on your iSCSI interfaces and it needs to be set all the way through the network so if let's say if you have this host a switch and then your your iSCSI target it should be set on all those interfaces so just a little side note there okay so what we're gonna do is we're gonna need to start setting up these connections so that they can communicate with one another the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna want to set up the heartbeat um, and I shouldn't have closed those out um, we're going to set up the heartbeat and we're going to set up that network. Okay, so we're going to go here. We're going to select properties. And as you can see here, I have 10.10.10, or I'm sorry, 10.10.11.1. No default gateway. I'm going to go over here. And over here, we are going to have, as soon as it decides to come up, we'll see that we have an IP address, and we'll set this here. This is our heartbeat 10.11.1. 10 and our subnet mask will be 255.255.255.0. We'll do close. Okay. So now what we need to ensure is that these two um, hosts can communicate to each other on, this, on that network segment, on this heartbeat segment here. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to do a couple of things. Um, we are actually going to have to turn off our firewall on our heartbeat and iSCSI networks. Now um, I'm saying just to turn it off versus allowing the specific ports because if you were in a production environment your heartbeat should really have its own network um, it doesn't require its own own um, or it doesn't require a lot of bandwidth and your iSCSI um, traffic should again be on its own network whether you are doing this with physically separate switches or whether you are setting up VLANs no network traffic no um, potentially harmful internet traffic should be re running on your heartbeat or iSCSI networks. So we're going to go through here, we're going to do icons and then Windows Firewall and for the domain network we can leave it on. And we are going to turn Windows Firewall on or off the domain we can leave it on for private networks and for public networks we're going to turn this off All right now again I would only um, say this if you had the circumstances like you should that your heartbeat and your eye scuzzy net your those networks should not be having any sort of land traffic on them they should be physically um, if not physically logically segmented away from all of your other traffic so we're gonna do that 
over here in the other control panel. And what will happen is because it doesn't recognize the um, the type of network that the heartbeat is, it will have very, very restrictive firewall policies, which will not effectively allow um, your heartbeat network to communicate. Now you could go through and you could manage the individual firewall policies themselves, um, and that would also be a good way to do it. But for your time in this video, we are just going to um, turn them off. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to go to our command prompt, and from cluster node one, let's take a look and see what our IP address is. And for our heartbeat network, we should remember that it's that 10 dot network, and this is 10.10.11.1. So let's see if we can ping 10.10.11.2. Ping 10.10.11.2. Okay, so we do have a ping back from here. Ping 10.10.11.1. Okay, and we do have a ping back from here. So now we do have communication between our heartbeat networks. So that's nicely set up. Um, if you do have issues um, communicating on your heartbeat network, check to make sure that your firewall settings have been applied. Don't go just into services there is the firewall service in the in the services panel here make sure that you do actually go through in the control panel and turn it off there um, see Windows firewall even if you turn it off here there will be some remnants um, as I had discovered in a build out a couple weeks ago of the firewall and it can still cause problems so do make sure that you are turning it off from the control panel using this interface here. So now we do have connectivity between the heartbeat networks. Um, now what we're going to do, um, let me just show you real quickly if you need to set up a, a host route. So if you need, in order to set up your host route out an interface, just in case you do have some problems, there's a couple of different ways that you can find your um, network interfaces and set up these host routes. And one of the easiest ways is just to go to the command line and type net sh int int for interface. We're going to do ipv4 because we want our ipv4 interfaces. We're going to do show interface. So we'll let this command run. So now you can see here, and sometimes it's not very intuitive, but you can see the MTU. Uh, we were just speaking about that here is 1500 bytes the status is connected this is what we've called our interfaces and the index of the interface is 17 so now if you wanted to add a static route um, just to be sure there was no routing issues you could do a simple command route add and then this will be the network so 10.10.11 Dot zero. That is the network. Then you will type mask 255, 255.0. Okay. Then the next hop address so will be what we're going to enter in here. So we know that cluster node 1 is 10.10.11.1. Okay. So we want our next hop address to be 10.10.11.2. That's where we're going. Then we're going to set our IF, our interface index, that we want to send this traffic out of to this value right here, 17. And what this will allow us to do, um, <laughs> A, it needs to be ran as administrator, but this will be the syntax. So you would have to right click and do run as administrator. But that would be the syntax if you wanted to set up some static routes on your host enable and that would enable your heartbeat networks to communicate um, I have run across a situation where for some reason whatever it was that the two heartbeat networks wouldn't communicate very effectively until I ran through and I added these toast routes and then you would do the same thing over on this host you would do net sh int ipv4 um, and we're gonna do show int and this will give you the interface. See, this one is 
index 16 over here for the iSCSI and then you would enter that same route add command so if you do run into any sort of problems with your um, heartbeat networks um, just keep that in mind and you can refer to this to help try to alleviate that okay so now that we've got our networks and they should be able to connect we want to make sure that we can connect out to our iSCSI target now I happen to know that our iSCSI target is going to be on 192.168.1.99 and um, this will be different whatever your network will be um, so let's just ping out okay and we have a good TTL low latency let's make sure that we can do the same thing on this one 192.168.1.99 okay and we can ping those network interfaces or that iSCSI target from both of our cluster nodes so that is important we have to have that shared storage so now what we're going to do is we are going to go over to our iSCSI initiator and we already have some of our targets selected here. So we have them here, but we don't have them over here on this host yet. So what we're going to do is I'll show you how to connect to your iSCSI targets on this system right here. Again, we know 192.168.1.99 um, that that, oops, I need to 192.168.1.99 that is our target so as you can see here we have a couple of disks that are available we have cluster data we have quorum and we have vdisks vdisks is not something that we're going to be using but these are the two disks that we are going to reach out and grab so the first thing that we're going to grab is quorum so we're going to connect to that and the second one that we're going to grab there is cluster data so that's done there so as you can see, VDisk is inactive, cluster data, let's just connect to that. Okay, let's make that one. So these two are now connected. Now the Quorum disk is what we're going to be using. If you did watch the last video, Quorum is the small disk that we're going to use to share that cluster data between the two hosts. The um, cluster data is what we're actually going to be using to run our um, SQL service and install that data on. So that's that. Now we have these two disks over here. Let's connect. So we're going to connect there. And we're going to connect to our cluster data. So now we have those connected. And there's a couple of different things that you can do. Um, we have favorites here. I'll just take you through a small tour. Um, volumes and devices we don't have any mount points yet you can actually use radius to authenticate to different services um, we have talked about that before uh, in, in our um, VPN video uh, things like that so it's actually pretty simple though to go through and to actually connect to iSCSI targets Microsoft has done a really good job in giving us this nice tool so we're gonna go OK and now what we're going to do is we are we need to go and manage our local disks because just because we've added them oh they did repopulate here um, and they did populate here if they don't populate for you what I want to do is I want to show you how to use disk management and we'll just get this set up so we can take you through the whole process so we'll do manage. So if you didn't have these, okay, we're going to go through and we're going to delete the volume and we'll delete this cluster data volume here. Um, if it populates for you, if your SAN team or NAS team has already formatted and set these disks up, that's excellent. Um, these are repopulating because I went through this once already in preparation for the tutorial. Um, but I want to show you how to do this because there's a couple steps here so now you are presented um, in your and again we're just in disk management right very simple as if you were to be managing local disks and this is the difference between a file share and an iSCSI or fiber channel drive um, a file share is presented as a file system whereas your iSCSI or fi fi uh, fiber channel pardon me it is actually presented at the block level just like a local hard drive would be presented so if you were to map a file share on your network it would not show up here 
So that is one of the differences between things like iSCSI, Fiber Channel, and just a map network drive. It's how it's presented to the operating system. So what we're going to do here is we're going to need to um, just right click. We're going to do a new simple volume. And this is our quorum. And as you can see, it's only one gigabyte. If you do remember from our last video, the quorum disk only has to be 500 megabytes. But um, my simple NAS unit, the smallest disk size that I could make was one gigabyte. So that's why we have that here. We, we do need to assign it a drive letter. Okay, this is important for the clustering, so we're going to do E. We are going to uh, format it. We're going to leave the, the default unit size, and this we will call Quorum. Q-U-O-R-U-M. Let me just make sure that I... Q-U-O-R-U-M, that is spelled correctly. And we are going to perform a quick format. It's formatting now. Okay, so it is a primary partition. Um, <clears throat> can do set this, and now we are going to create another new simple volume. We're going to use the full disk size. We again are going to assign it a drive letter, and we will call this SQL data. Okay, and we are going to use NTFS and perform a format. Okay, so now we have these two disks, and if we rescan, okay, so now you can see that this information has populated over here. So when you make a change to an iSCSI disk from one host, it should automatically propagate over to your other host. That's something to keep in mind. So now, just as a quick review, we have um, gone through, we have set up our network interfaces, um, our heartbeat, right? Um, we have set up our disks in our hosts. Remember, both of these computers are in the domain, okay? So that is a requirement. Um, in the next video, what we're going to do is we are actually going to go through and perform the cluster install. Um, I wanted to have this set up because these are critical steps that you need to perform in order to get your systems ready for the cluster install. So again, thank you for watching this video um, on winservetoots.com. Um, if you appreciate the videos, please do click our ads. Um, they help support the the videos and the hosting and the hardware that I purchased to bring these to you. So do check out our sponsors and see what they have to offer. It's much appreciated. Um, I will try to get the next video out probably in about four or five days. Um, so check back with us regularly. Do stop by the website. And if you have any questions, please drop us a line. We have a comment section on the website. We're always looking for new ideas for videos. Uh, and again, thank you for watching here on winservetoots.com.